and we'll get to that at the end. Uh, also, last item on the slide here, uh, we are commonly asked about accessing the presentation at a later time, either the uh, slides or the recording. We are recording here. Uh, and yes, everyone who registered or attended will be getting a follow-up email with links to where you can find the slides as well as the archive recording. Uh, we'll post this on the DA site. So if you want to uh, share with anyone on your team at your district or go back over the presentation, you'll be able to do that uh, later on. Okay, so with that, uh, on to our presentation here. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us Chris Fierro. He's Director of Data and Analytics there at Dude Solutions. Uh, and so he's going to walk us through our presentation for today. So with that, uh, Chris, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to our webinar. Thanks for having us, Kurt. We appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for taking your time out today to jump on a webinar and learn a little bit about what we're up to and, and how we're approaching things and hopefully have a good discussion toward the end. All right. With that, we'll jump right in. So how to implement predictive school operations. Uh, we're going to lead off with uh, a, just a basically setting the table for data and analytics as a whole. And this is a great quote from Peter Sondergaard, who's head of analytics at Gartner, where data is the oil of the 21st century and analytics is that combustion engine. And this is something that I definitely subscribe to. Uh, we are seeing more and more in our everyday lives data permeating anything and everything. Uh, and there's always the question of then what can we do with that data? Uh, or we may not even realize that there's data to be tracked. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like in our day to day and have, have some fun on what's out there, um, talk about some real world stories, uh, and then we'll get into looking at their, their getting the right foundation for doing predictive operations, what kind of story you may be able to tell, um, how you can introduce predictive operations, and then uh, have some Q&A toward the end. So looking at our day to day, for those of you out there who may be into smart home products or smart home automation, uh, maybe that's yourself or maybe a significant other or a family friend, uh, we're starting to see this really cut into every aspect of our home life but with appliances and smoke detectors and dishwashers and refrigerators. And of course, the, the cars that we drive and how they're connecting to our own personal Wi-Fi networks. Uh, this data is now being tracked more broadly and we're actually starting to get more interesting insights about how we live. Uh, and, and for those of you who are, are doing it from a convenience standpoint, uh, it can really add some, some fun to your life, but it can certainly add some frustration too when things stop working. Uh, sometimes it, it's nice just to be able to go back to the basics when things just aren't automated and, and aren't electronic, they're just manual. Uh, but these are things that we're starting to see permeate our life. And, uh, and what's important here is that it's also for the different teachers and students and the staff that you guys work with. Uh, what you may see at school is uh, also being seen a number of other places in people's lives. Where we work, that's a picture of the Dude Solutions building here in Care, North Carolina, just outside Raleigh. And as an organization, we're very focused on how we help others with maintenance and how they're thinking about the, the broader set of operations and everything they have under stewardship. And that covers maintenance and events and energy and, of course, capital planning. Uh, but what, that's just a subset of, of the overall items that may go into your, your operations. We also need to consider uh, things like headcount and the different items that you're using, the software for the business or the software for the school. Uh, the environment for the students, and uh, just a number of other things that go into it, uh, which now also includes the hardware and, and how we can either retrofit or bring in new pieces of hardware to collect data on an organization or a specific business, uh, and more specifically, a location where someone may be physically located. Next, of course, is schools. Uh, Schools are always changing, and uh, that's it's one of our, our biggest assets from as a country when it comes to infrastructure and how we look at maintaining it. Uh, what I think is more interesting here is how data is getting used uh, from just a, a macro and micro perspective. We we look at student performance data, teacher performance data, 
Uh, and then we also start to look at uh, more broadly uh, basic budgetary guidance and economic data that would help different cities and regions and states make decisions on how should we continue to maintain schools? Uh, should we look to invest in them and replace or repair items? Or should we even look at creating new schools or building new schools in other parts of the city based on geographic and demographic data, uh, how things are trending or changing in an area? And so uh, when I think about education as a whole, uh, I, I certainly think about the intersection of maintenance plus how families are living and how the education system is changing and how all that comes together. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. When it comes to entertainment in our lives, so we're right now living in a time where uh, the movie theater is entering our living rooms. And hopefully some of you guys have used or seen some of these products. Uh, so with Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon Prime, uh, they're now using data to figure out what kind of things that we want to watch. And Netflix has a great story about the series House of Cards, where they looked at data from individuals watching movies around specific actors and specific topics and content, and effectively built that entire series based on that, those data-driven approaches uh, to come up with what really became a, a pretty successful hit for the network. And that's really what we're starting to see is that the traditional TV networks are changing into these networks based on data. And uh, the consumer really is put in the driver's seat to, to drive content and drive some of the decision making that's happening. Uh, and, and not only are they networks, but they're networks that produce their own content now. Uh, and we're, we're seeing that in a number of other areas and industries. And the last one is healthcare. So uh, healthcare is very personal. We are all patients at some point in our lives. The question is when. Uh, or uh, if, if we're not a patient actively, we may be taking care of a loved one or a significant other uh, or a child in some way, shape, or form uh, where they're navigating something on a day-to-day -day basis or a weekly or a monthly basis. And so healthcare is very interesting to me because it's, it's actually a whole lot like maintenance operations. Uh, we have a whole lot of different assets under stewardship, and, and we need to do our best to take care of it given the economics that we have in place and the teams that we have in place and, and the skill set that we have in place. And it's very similar for the healthcare system. It's how do we best take care of the people in a certain area of the country uh, based on their demographic and based on their age and what they may be navigating uh, based on weather or population changes, et cetera. And so we'll transition out of the day-to-day -day into a fun topic called spurious correlations. Uh, wouldn't be good fun with data unless you were able to have some good laughs. And so a uh, quick context here, just a definitions on correlation and causation. And the major premise here is that when you look at enough data and you have enough of it, you can really find correlations in anything. And you can really stare it down and, and find patterns. And so the key is to look for those correlations, but then also back into some of the causation details. And so look for cause and effect where appropriate. And this is hard to do, but it's important when you're deciding to collect your own data across the board uh, and make decisions for your business. And so just some fun things here, looking at both cheese and golf courses. Uh, what we see here is that there is, based on per capita cheese consumption, uh, it's highly correlated with revenue generated by golf courses. And so that's just a, a fun coincidence. There's actually no cause and effect here, but just fun to see that there are completely disparate data sets that can have high correlated value. And next is ice cream and sharks. So this is, as you see, ice cream sales increase, so do shark attacks. Uh, these can be fun things that you share with your students if you so choose. Uh, the, the cause and effect is just warm weather, but these are fun stories to show in the data that can drive some good laughter. And hopefully there are some cases where you guys might be able to see your own correlations with the data, uh, perhaps based on how your teams are operating or how an HVAC is operating. It doesn't always have to be serious. Uh, there can be some humor added into it uh, to, to lighten the mood on what may be going on when it comes to looking at data for decision making. And just to recap, though, what about causation? It's really easy to actually find correlation. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get to this. Uh, the, the hard part is actually causation. And it's really because it's hard to narrow the field uh, it's very expensive to, to control all the variables. Uh, it's also really hard to get specific. 
Uh, there's a, a number of categories and topics out there that are, are bubbling up. There's one specifically around causal inference, where it really helps somebody who's really digging into the statistics identify cause and effect. Um, probably the, the big takeaway I would have for correlation and causation is that it tends to be a basket of options for cause and effect. And so while you may have a discussion with somebody and they say, can you explain to me exactly why something happened? Uh, the data may not always be obvious, uh, and so you may have to offer up a handful of solutions to why something occurred. Uh, so why did a specific HVAC unit fail unexpectedly? Or why did a specific roof line have a, a number of leaks earlier in the year than you wanted? Uh, and so it's a number of inputs, typically. It's, it's never just a, a single instance. Uh, it takes a number of things to, to dance together to make something happen. And so look for those basket of options to explain cause and effect. All right, just some data stories here. So there's an application, maybe some have heard of it, called Foursquare. A number of years ago, it was a, a very popular app on mobile phones, uh, especially for students and teenagers and college students. And what they're doing is using it to check into various locations uh, across the country. And with the data from that lo location check-in, the product Foursquare was able to get really specific on where different businesses and schools and sports teams and stadiums were located all across the country. Uh, and so it, it basically came up with the, the most specific location finder that could be utilized by software companies. And the, the secondary use of that is a story that came out of using data from Foursquare, location data, and the restaurant Chipotle. A number of years back, there was a salmonella incident with Chipotle, and Foursquare put out a, a flyer on the potential that Chipotle would be announcing some, some not so good news a couple days before they officially did, because they had seen a significant drop in the number of check-ins and the number of people going in and out of Chipotle restaurants based on how their software worked. Uh, and sure enough, uh, a couple of days later, Chipotle put out an announcement that they had an incident with salmonella and they would have to do some due diligence and cleaning up of that problem, uh, which did bring down sales for a significant window of time. And so those were some interesting things where data correlated from a completely different thing did have a, a cause and effect relationship with something that actually happened at Chipotle. Uh, but they didn't really know that until they made the announcement. Next area is one of our hopefully favorite shopping stores we've all been in, Target. Uh, Target is uh, a leading brand, especially when it comes to consumer loyalty. Uh, if anyone has ever used their, their app, Cartwheel, uh, that it's highly addictive. Um, but with that highly addictive app comes a whole lot of data that they enjoy collecting on individuals. And there's this uh, story, again, you can look this up similar to the uh, Foursquare in the Chipotle article, uh, there's a, a dad who started to receive coupons in the mail about diapers. And while he thought this was funny initially, um, he, he still had the question because all of his kids were teenagers. Uh, and what he didn't realize is that Target knew his daughter had gone and purchased a pregnancy test. Uh, and with that changed the way that data was being tracked and they started to ship coupons for the news of how their families would be changing down the road. And so, uh, it's a true story, and they did find, find out that there was some news on the way. Uh, and again, this is just how data can change things and, uh, and actually know things maybe even ahead of uh, a tough conversation that may be coming. All right, so getting that foundation squared away, we really want to share all that just to, to tee up your thinking of how do I set up the right foundation for my team and my operation. So let's dive in there. The first, why analytics? And I'll give you guys a chance to digest some of this. And ultimately, it's to drive that richer reporting and that improved decision making uh, back into your organization. And a lot of it is just how we're supporting change management and driving efficiencies back into your teams or into the environments that you guys are stewards of. Um, so the next sequence is based on that foundation of what you're trying to think about, 
you want to tee up what kind of questions that you may have. Uh, so we label this that predictive vision for tomorrow. But as an individual and as a team, you want to ask yourself questions of where have I been and where am I today and then where am I headed? And so across these three major categories for work and asset, facilities and usage, and then energy and utilities, which, which are key swim lanes that we work with our clients and customers on day in and day out at these solutions, we help you think about those types of questions that you need to answer. So hopefully some of these items do resonate with each of you on the phone today. They can also be a placeholder for some thinking we'll do later on in the webinar. Next is as you get the, the questions together, it's thinking about your team and the mission you're on. And so this here, our data team at Duke Solutions, this is our mission. How we wanna provide that deeper understanding for decision-making, change management, and efficiencies back into your organization. And I would highly encourage the same uh, for your team to what's your, what's your mission and how are you thinking about the people that you are affecting on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, that's both directly and indirectly. Uh, there, you guys are in, in a place where you uniquely get to affect a whole lot of students' lives, which has a, a significant ripple effect on the number of families that you'll touch on a day-to-day -day basis. And so in the data, there can be a, a significant mission to make sure that maybe at least one, one of those groups is affected in a positive way on a daily basis. And so we look at a framework around where we've been and where we are. Uh, so following up on those questions, we wanna think about the basics and we look at three things. So what reports, what dashboards, and what KPIs do we wanna to begin to measure? Uh, and for those of you new to this area of analytics, uh, it's really doing the basics of what kind of information do we need to pull together so that we can take a look at things and really start to have that discussion around the questions that we had earlier. Uh, and more specifically, that report may just be a PDF uh, or an Excel spreadsheet that we circulate uh, for ourselves, for our teams, or for our different peers that we're working with. The dashboard is a way to have that heads up display of everything that may be going on related to that question. Uh, sometimes it tends to be that more near time or near real time display of what, what's going on. And lastly is that set of KPIs or those key performance indicators. And those are the different metrics and insights that we're trying to track to improve our organization. And there's that uh, quote of uh, basically, oh, I'm totally messing it up right now in my head, I apologize. Um, what you measure is what you manage. And so we wanna make sure that we're measuring the right stuff. And this is never the intent of uh, trying to focus on one individual or focus on one problem area, but it, it's really how do we as a team make something better and uh, push ourselves to do the right thing and to improve an area of our organization or an area of our team. Uh, and so these are great things to keep an eye on and, and we'll come back to these in a little bit. And so analytics dashboard, this is an example of what we have at Deep Solutions and our core central maintenance management system uh, that we call Asset Essentials. This is a way for our customers to get a vis visibility into those different reports, dashboards, and KPIs across the board when they're working with their individual teams. Um, they can see how they're operating at the, an organization level, at an individual location level, by team, by individual, et cetera. Uh, and they can use these dashboards for driving those conversations that we talked about earlier or produce reports as needed. Uh, we also offer up the different library of KPIs so that they can see and you can see how you're tracking when it comes to specific areas of your operation. Uh, next piece is specific to reports. This is just an example of how one client was tracking their preventive maintenance to non-preventive maintenance ratios across specific sites that they have under stewardship. Uh, and again, this is something that they use specifically for their monthly staff meetings to drive conversation on where they may need to pay attention or where they may need to have some conversations on resourcing or getting things more up to par with their organization standards. And for discussion later, as well as just ideas, uh, these are some example dashboards and reports that we would recommend no matter where you are on that journey that you ha may have with data. Uh, you wanna take a look at what you're trying to get started with. Uh, so if you're, you're just getting started, you wanna pick one or two. Uh, and if you're way down that road, perhaps you have every one of these uh, you're tracking. Uh, it may be one of the things you're doing manually. It may be something you're doing with software or a mix of both. 
Uh, so we definitely recommend taking a look at these areas. This is based off of the thousands of conversations that we've had with um, basically our, our market and our customers out there. Uh, and if you need to highlight a couple. These are the three that we would recommend off the bat that you should take a look at. Uh, what's important here is that this is the, these three in, in particular can drive a lot of really good conversations with your immediate team, uh, typically with superiors that you may be getting budget from, uh, as well as doing conversations with your peers at other schools or other operations teams uh, in, in other markets. Uh, and this is a really good way just to kind of level set and see how things may be going for you uh, versus others. Uh, and it's also a good way to justify the different needs that you may have. We typically see groups doing a lot of discussion around qualitative data. It's a whole lot of gut feel, and we, we kind of know how things are going, but they can't necessarily pinpoint it. And, uh, and so our goal is always to help you quantify those gut feelings. Uh, and, and make sure that they're justified. And the data can really help you do that and tell that story. And a changing landscape is up next. Uh, our industry is always changing. So uh, we're at a really interesting time when it comes to maintenance operations. Uh, we, uh, we talk about internally how it's, it's that really interesting and beautiful blend of old and new. Uh, so we uh, may be inside of a school that is 50 years old, and it's got a, a HVAC or a air handler that's about 20, 25 years old, and then you're sitting in a room with your three-month-old LED lighting. Uh, and so the same is true for the different staff that you may be working with. You've got individuals who are looking at retirement within the next several months or several years, uh, followed by uh, a, a mix of individuals just entering the workforce, and they're young and uh, they have different expectations of what work looks like and what technology looks like. Uh, and so just like you face different, uh, different landscape of people uh, and a different landscape of the infrastructure that you have under stewardship, uh, the same is true for us as a business that serves individuals like yourself and teams like yourself. Uh, we want to look at how you guys can uh, do more with less. Uh, we consistently hear uh, that is the theme of many teams. It's how can I do more with less? And you're being asked to do more with less. And data and software is a great way to supplement and make your teams more efficient. And when you, when you have to do more with less, it means you have to figure out where to put your time and attention very specifically. Uh, and so that's where data can step in and, and help you narrow the field. In addition, it, it's a tremendous opportunity for how we look at something called predictive operations. And that's just a, a good way to look at the data from the past and the present to take a peek around the corner for what's coming down the road. So this all leads us into this area that we call what's your story or what is your story? And so everything that we just talked about over the last 20 minutes or so, we want to figure out what kind of story do you want to tell for you as an individual, your team, and the way that you're affecting the different operations and the campuses and the, everything that you've got under stewardship. Uh, and this is your place in your story and how it fits into a bigger story, which may be with other teams at your organization and maybe with teams across town, uh, maybe with other campuses or around different regions of the country. Uh, those are all things that you got to think about. And ultimately is uh, data is best conveyed through story. And so we want to help you think about what's your place in that story and using that data to tell it really well from both that qualitative and quantitative standpoint. So with that story in mind, you got to do a handful of things. So first is the plan, the team, and the timeline. And so if you're already on this road, that's fantastic. If you're just thinking about getting started, that's great as well. And the, the key is setting up projects and initiatives that are geared towards specific outcomes that you can get started on over the next 30, 60, and 90 days. And make sure that you don't do this alone. So thinking about your team, who do you know immediately? But maybe you can supplement your team with individuals from other departments, or more specifically, if you have the opportunity to partner with a local university. There's oftentimes great talent at the, at the student level where people can step in and support you, uh, especially from a data perspective. So figure out who that team is and, uh, and put them together. Execution, each strategy for breakfast. This is one of my favorite quotes. And it's important to plan, but it's even more to execute. And it's okay to fumble. Uh, just you got to keep getting up and make sure you iterate and tune things so that you can get to this type of outcomes that you're looking for. 
but the key is to get started. And next, uh, as many of you know, you live in that world where you're always being asked to do more with less, which means you have to rigorously prioritize. Uh, you have to make tough choices every day of who can have your attention uh, and basically leave it all on the field or leave it all on the table every day when you get home. And so it, it'll all still be there tomorrow. So figuring out what's most important for today and for this week and, and for this month is a, a key thing for making this all go. All right, setting that foundation into peeking around the corner. And some of this is uh, some of the fun stuff we have the opportunity to do as an organization, having worked with tens of thousands of clients uh, across the United States. We can start to ask different kinds of questions. And so uh, we've shown you a number of different areas and, and pitched a couple of those questions in previous slides, but our team starts to look at those questions and we call them onion questions. So how can we peel back the onion even further and ask the questions differently? Uh, and so I'll give you a chance to digest those, but those two at the top are pretty significant. So what are things gonna look like over the next six, 12 and 18 months? And then how should we be adjusting our PM schedules based on historical maintenance specific to corrective and a number of others? And these are how things can start to change when you have the data in place because you can start to make projections. Uh, and you can start to make estimates on where you're going to put your time and attention. Uh, and these five questions, uh, hopefully they resonate with a number of you. These are key for us uh, answering them so that they can drive better discussions, not just about where you've been and where you are, but then you can start to have the conversation on where we're headed. And so highlighting those first two as I did in previous areas, those would be areas that I would definitely think about. If you're already far down this road on reporting and data and analytics, I would definitely encourage you to look at these types of questions when it comes to where you can make adjustments in your ratios or make adjustments on your projections. Uh, as many of you are, you're, you're working on annual budgets. And so anything you can do to help forecast and be more specific on what, what's coming uh, can go a whole lot better for you when you have the data to back it up. All right, uh, this is a little bit of where the data can get interesting and. Uh, depending on how sophisticated you want to get with the tools in your toolbox for looking at the data, um, we think about predictive operations in these first three areas. And just for context, the predictive maintenance category is really broad. Uh, there are a whole lot of areas you could spend your time in. And so similar to the questions earlier in the deck where you got to figure out a couple to get started, uh, if this is the first time you're dipping your toe into predictive maintenance, I would encourage you to do the, the same thing. Pick one or two questions that you want to start tracking the data on very heavily to then start to project or forecast out what may be coming. And so the three areas that we spent time on as an organization and helping others with is forecasting, classification, health and risk. Forecasting is specifically an area where we help you project your future based on your past. Classification is a, a way for you to have cleaner and better data. A lot of times the, the work orders or the requests that come in are, are hard to parse through. And some of you are probably intimately familiar with having to track someone down and ask them what they meant or get clarity on where, what specific location they meant when they put in the work request. Uh, and last is health and risk. And so uh, some of you know that you've got a number of different units like HVACs or different air handlers or a different problem building. And, uh, and you kind of think you're touching it a, a few, many two times, but you're not quite sure, um, we can help you quantify that the health of that building or the health of a certain asset based on what we're seeing across all of our customers working on similar assets uh, when they're using our system. So that's some of the work that we've started to dig into uh, and be helpful for our clients. This is actually a, a view of that maintenance forecast that we just talked about. Uh, so we're making this available to customers so they can look at all their historical work order creation, work order completion, and then their different mix of PM versus non-PM or preventative versus reactive maintenance. And it gives you a chance to look at your last 36 months of data and peek around the corner up to 12 months. Uh, this helps really well for budget projection, uh, as well as planning around certain skill set needs or contractor needs based on what may be coming. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you don't have that much data, you can certainly get a smaller forecast uh, based on whatever's available. Uh, and we, again, are leveraging data to, to predict the future here using some statistical models. 
Uh, next is uh, a concept we're actually working on related to asset health and risk. And this is allowing individuals to get that map view of their campus or a specific set of buildings that they have under stewardship and to track specifically in this case, how certain roof lines or HVACs or air handlers or other specific key capital assets are performing relative to the maintenance histories that they have under their belts. Uh, so in this case, you can see that red pin under for building five. Uh, so that's calling out that specifically there's a problem area on that building. Uh, and so you may want to click on that and check out what may be occurring there. It could be uh, a, in order a number of work orders related to the roof line or to HVAC systems or air handlers or other key areas. Um, we had a, a fun conversation with some clients a little while back. They said, what happens when everything's red? Um, so we didn't have the best answer there, but we realized that sometimes that is a reality. Uh, when things like uh, the whole whole building's on fire or the whole campus is on fire. Uh, so uh, specifically there, it's uh, you got to eat the elephant one bite at a time. All right. And then looking at tomorrow's questions. So when, when we look at that data to help you project out how can we make adjustments for these areas of our organization or how can we project things going into the future? Thank you for that. William. What we're seeing here is how the questions may change. Uh, and so, and just for participants on the phone, we'll make sure to send out the, the slides afterwards so you'll have hard copies of these as well as the recording. So you'll be able to follow back up with this if you need to. Um, but we ask questions about the data uh, of what, how do things change and what are the, the best kind of ways to look at the data? Uh, and so these would also be encouraging questions for each of you as you're trying to, to push your operations team. And, and so making sure there's some accountability there. Um, how, what's it look like for you guys to improve? And so back to that story, what kind of operations team do you want to lead? Uh, but more specifically, what does a great operations team look like? Um, and then for those, uh, it's usually top of mind, how can we increase our, our PM schedules? Um, what does that actually look like? Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be 100%. Um, it, it may be a, a ratio that's more like a 60-40. Um, or maybe a ratio that's more like a 30-70. Uh, it just depends on where you are to figure out uh, how best to approach the need. Um, and it may be specific to just a basket of assets uh, versus the, the whole operation that you have. And there's other areas that you should be asking those questions. Um, we ask the same questions when we look at our data. Uh, we, we have data across tens of thousands of operations teams across the country. And so we have to do the same thing when we're looking at the data and making recommendations, we, we want to do that based on teams that are in similar areas that you guys are, that they're, they're in the education vertical and they're in a school that's of the similar sh shape and size and teacher and student count that you guys have uh, in similar parts of the country. So those are different kinds of questions that we have based on the data so that we can help you guys see comparisons and see benchmarks for things that make sense to you guys. All right, that wraps us up here close to the end. I think about just a couple more slides. So quick poll question. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, yes, and to our audience, if, uh, if you'd like more information, uh, as it says here, about how Dude Solutions can help you take the next step uh, in this direction, we're talking about uh, use of predictive data in your maintenance and operations, of your school district, uh, you can just select in the poll at the right side of your screen there. If you are interested in uh, getting some more information, we just want to make this available for you. Uh, just select yes, if so, and click submit at the bottom, and uh, someone will be sure to uh, follow up with you uh, with some more information. So thanks to everyone. Uh, we're going to get to the Q&A portion here. I'll just give you a second uh, for the poll question. All right, and that wraps up here. Thanks to everybody for your uh, participation. Uh, yes, we're going to get to the Q&A here, as I said. A uh, couple quick reminders for everyone. Uh, we get uh, a lot of questions asking about uh, accessing the slides or the recording. Uh, yes, as Chris just mentioned there, we'll be following up with everybody with uh, an email with links to those. So if you want to go back over it, 
share with anyone at your district, you'll have opportunity to do that. Uh, in addition, if you do have a question here for Chris, uh, please feel free to enter in the Q&A, bottom right-hand corner there. Uh, and thanks in advance for your participation. We have a bunch of pretty interesting questions here uh, for you, Chris. Uh, one came in, uh, this one came in pretty early on, it says, uh, are predictive analytics the only or best use of these type of data? Would it not provide more value, even more value? to be able to use operations data to estimate the effect on student outcomes, which would require data from multiple systems to be integrated into one. So a pretty interesting question there, kind of broadening uh, even beyond what you're talking about, just raising the question of this kind of data, uh, looking at it across the school system. Chris, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's an awesome question. There are, are definitely what we see from, from customers and some work we've done is looking at additional third-party data sets. Uh, so looking at how maintenance data may affect student performance data. Um, sometimes we also see uh, where people weave in like census data as well as uh, general economic data. Um, there's actually some really nice white papers out there on, on this topic uh, where it, it, they're seen as effectively that a strong maintenance program does correlate with uh, better environments for student performance. Uh, it also is, uh, has a, a high correlation to attracting uh, talent and, and actually family support. Uh, so there, there's some really good stuff out there. I don't have them right offhand, but if I'll do some digging to see if we can't circle back on that. No, no promises, but I have definitely read some white papers on the topic. Uh, but great question. Um, I, I definitely recommend it. Uh, again, that goes back to what kind of conversation are you trying to drive with the data? Uh, and anywhere you can show how, how maintenance and running a, a strong team and keeping an eye on the environment is also affecting other aspects of the organization is great for business and, and great for conversation. Sure, yeah, absolutely, thank you. It's a, an interesting uh, idea, interesting topic uh, to delve in. Um, Let's see, uh, next, and that's a good lead in to this next question uh, when we talk about data from different sources and different systems. Uh, the question says, how can districts get uh, richer reporting when the different systems being used do not provide cost efficient methods of integrating the data between them? So kind of the interoperability question when you talk about sources of data there. There were several questions more or less asking that that same kind of thing. Chris, do you have thoughts on that? Um, so, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this because we run into this too. Um, so there, what, what I try to think about is what, uh, what kind of tools do you want to have in your toolbox? And then also, what are the different data sets that you're trying to get to? Uh, and so uh, there are cases where the getting to certain data can be cost prohibitive. So sometimes we'll look for an alternative route um, uh, if it's not like an open source route um, or we'll, we'll go directly to a specific vendor or a specific partner and try to negotiate a relationship where we can actually get access to the data uh, for different purposes. Uh, typically what we've seen is that uh, when, when you are, to, are trying to get to certain data and it's, it's cost prohibitive to get to it um, or sometimes even it's almost like information blocking. Um, when you take a more academic stance on it uh, and, and not something we're going to go and try to monetize it or make money off of it, uh, they're more amenable to, to the topic. Uh, so that's how I would recommend maybe uh, broaching the subject. Um, if, uh, if that's something you guys want to discuss with us, I, I'm ha happy to take it offline and, and just discuss one-on-one -on -one based on just what I've experienced in my career. Um, it, sometimes it just takes a creative path. Sometimes you do just hear no. Um, and so uh, you either have to find an alternative or you have to do without. Um, but if it's something that it, it, is, it is your data, um, which there's some, some great data stewardship topics, and especially with the, the topic of GDPR, um, which is the, the, basically the European data protection and the new rise of the California privacy law. Um, if it's your organization's data in a piece of software, there's some, some pretty nice uh, access rights that you have to be able to get to that data. Uh, in a, a non-restrictive way when it comes to economics. So um, some of that's just knowing what, what you have rights to. Uh, it may not be easy to get to the data, but uh, it is something where you, you may have eligibility to get a copy of it if needed or interested. 
Um, so it, it's a big topic of conversation, but if, if you want to maybe talk specifics, I'm happy to see if we can help you guys. Okay, sure, thank you. And uh, let's see, you. I think you gave some examples of this uh, earlier on when you were talking about reports, dashboards, and KPIs. Uh, question just asked, do you have any recommendations for which reports, dashboards, and KPIs to track? Uh, yeah, so we, I'm going to kind of fly back over here to my quick slides here. Um, so it, it really does depend on what you're trying to, what outcomes you're trying to achieve. Uh, but off off the cuff, I would definitely look at just normal PM versus non-PM ratios. Uh, I would definitely look at all of your, basically the life cycle of all your work orders. Uh, and I would segment those. So I would look at open versus assigned versus completed versus deferred. And I would do that by location and technician. Uh, and then uh, I would certainly look at that uh, by, at the uh, location building level too. Um, and what I mean by that is if there's specific parts of the building or specific locations that you can get to. Uh, that's how I, I talk about recommending most teams getting started. And then uh, basically we think about it from in concentric circles moving out from there. Uh, so looking at your your team and their skill set, looking at schedules, uh, maybe look at like work shifts, first shift, second shift, third shift, um, looking at their individual performance, um, looking at everything you have under stewardship. Uh, so where are you spending your time on work orders? Uh, and then basically tracking then all the costs associated with that. So inventory parts, contractors, uh, those aspects really start to come into play. Uh, so for that richer reporting, it's uh, how granular do you want to get on the detail? Uh, and then a lot of times it's what kind of decision is going to be made based off of that data. Uh, and so sometimes if it's a, like a large capital need, they want very granular data. Uh, and so that's where I would encourage you to, to put in the elbow grease and get into that cost data so you can justify it. Uh, other times it's more simple and just says, hey, we need to, we need to spend a little bit more time with electricians on this building because we're, we're having a lot more electrical needs um, or we're having a lot more plumbing needs. And so that might just be a skills gap or, or a need where you need to supplement for a time with a contractor. Uh, again, just depends on the outcome that you're trying to understand and then specifically that decision that needs to be made based on the data. Uh, and so that, that's just kind of richer reporting uh, where you may have data you're tracking. Uh, also go to other departments. So uh, I would encourage complementary data sets or complementary data that helps you justify uh, why you may be seeing an increase in plumbing work orders. It's because uh, attendance levels have increased or you're having a, a, a larger number of summer camps uh, come into the building than traditionally uh, in, in the past. This, things like that. Uh, that's where I've encouraged you to try to brighten up that picture for data and reporting, provide the additional context. Okay, sure. And you gave some great advice there, I think, for someone uh, getting started or moving in this direction. And uh, this is a common question that we get about all kinds of topics, but it asks, so what advice do you have for those who may just be getting started uh, on their data journey or headed in this direction? Are there first steps or initial ideas you'd recommend for a, a school district uh, leader or administrator uh, looking to head in this direction? Yeah, so what we want to look at is similar to what we just talked about, uh, just thinking about maybe those first two areas. But b before you do that, it's who, who's the team that you're going to do this with? And then what's your timeline and plan? I would definitely make sure to set quick and easy milestones. Uh, so 30 day, 60 day, 90 day goals where you can actually uh, achieve an outcome and get the data that you need. Uh, I'd also uh, encourage you to get a, basically a, a mentor or another individual to help keep you accountable uh, who may be doing this at another district or another school system or maybe even in another department. And they can help you pull that data together and go through it, make sure it's clear and something that they understand and is relatable, and then uh, go have the conversation you want to have with the data with someone else. Sure. Uh, it's, it sounds like great advice. Thank you uh, very much, Chris. Uh, well, it looks like I think we've hit just about all of our questions here. And uh, if you didn't get your question answered 
Uh, we'll collect all those after the event here, and uh, someone will follow up with you uh, if there's anything that we can help you with uh, or follow up on. So uh, on behalf of everyone here at District Administration, I'd like to thank, uh, thank our speaker for today. Of course, Chris, once again, thanks so much for being with us and sharing your time and expertise. And thank you again to our sponsor, Dude Solutions, for their generous support of our webinar here today. And of course, to all of you in our audience, thank you so much for joining us. I do hope you found our presentation and webinar informative and useful to you. Producing events like this one is just part of our mission here at DA to inform school district leaders like you about the latest news and trends in K-12 leadership and management. You'll find more coverage about issues such as the ones we discussed here in the pages of our print magazine as well as on our website and digital edition through additional web seminars like this one and through our various email newsletters which you can sign up for uh, right from our website. And as I mentioned before, uh, for those of you who would like to share this with your colleagues, anyone on your team at your districts, uh, or if you want to go back over the presentation at your own pace, we, uh, you can access the recording at the URL on your screen here, or you can access the slides. Uh, you'll find links to both the recording and the slides in a follow-up email again, that you'll receive later on. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. If you want to go back over it, uh, share with anyone on your team, you'll have an opportunity to do that. So that is everything for today's event. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Once again, I'm Kurt Isaac Early for District Administration on behalf of our production team and everyone here at DA. Goodbye, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Take care.